Our first presenter for tonight will be Ryan Feifley. From a young age, Ryan's fascination with science was nothing short of a life calling. Now Ryan is an undergraduate astrophysics student in George Mason University's College of Science. In 2014, he received a grant from the Oscar program to conduct research at the George Mason Observatory. He's also a student collaborator with NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. His current research focus is the field of gravitational microlensing. He also acts as a learning assistant for an astronomy class here at George Mason. Outside of school and research, Ryan is an avid writer and has written several science fiction books, books and short stories. And he actively pursues opportunities to act as a science communicator. His aim is to foster the curiosity of students and members of the public of all ages and lead them to a deeper appreciation and understanding of physics, space, and our place in this universe. So let's see what Ryan has for us tonight. So for the next 10 minutes, allow me to be your personal astrophysicist. Uh, for those of you with degrees in physics or understanding, uh, understandings of physics, uh, be your own uh, physicist, because you probably know more than me. Uh, so the topic is Microlensing Event Detection at the George Mason University. Now, as I type that, I realize that's probably as abstract as saying the astrophysics project where we detected stuff at the observatory. <laughs> well, we started out with this project with two main objectives. One, can we observe these events at the observatory? And two, if we can, what kind of quality of data do, are we going to get? You know, this is the first time we've tried observing these things. But the question you're asking yourself right now, probably, is what is microlensing? <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked. So, microlensing is like lensing, just smaller. Um, and if that's as clear as mud, let me elaborate further. <laughs> so, lens, microlensing, or gravitational lensing, is when you have a massive object that you're just looking at in the sky. So pretend there's a massive object here, and you are watching another object pass between you and that object. Now, close your eyes for just a second and imagine a trampoline. And you take a giant bowling ball and you set it in the middle of that trampoline. What's it going to do? It's going to warp the curvature of that trampoline. Now, that's an analogy to massive objects in space, like stars or galaxies. They warp space-time in a very similar way. So when you have things traveling through that warped space-time, the trajectory curves. Well, light does the same thing. Light curves through this, through this warped space-time. And so when you have your massive object here, and this other one is traversing this path and passing between you and this object, it lenses the light if it's luminous back there, and it actually magnifies the light that you see. Now, why, why is this important? Well, it gives you some characteristics about the star, but you can also detect planets with it. You detect planets that are too far out to detect with other methods like transits and radio velocity. You can detect Jupiter-sized planets and Jupiter-sized radii, which is something we really we can do it, it's just very, very difficult right now. You have to wait you know, eight, nine years to see one transit signature, one radio velocity signature. And to follow up on that, it's another eight years. Uh, for us, it's a chance event, and it's a one-time thing, but if we get it, we get it. We know it's there. And so you can do this with stars, black holes, even rogue planets, which could have moons that are habitable around them, never known the warmth of a host star. So what you get when it lenses is this nice sort of setup here. You have the middle star lens, get lensing this background star, and then you have these arclets that form. So, where do we look? The Milky Way's galactic center. Why? Because the galactic center has the densest population of stars, so it's a higher probability that you're going to see one star passing from in front of another, and higher chance that you're going to be able to detect these events and these planets. And this makes us very happy. <laughs> and so, yes. The universe is smiling because we can do this. <laughs> now, for us, research impediments. So what did we have to deal with when we did the science is nothing without problems. Uh, and our research, that, that is. You always have issues with research, error and whatnot. So we had a geographic location problem. So it's, it's always better to look at the galactic bulge from the southern hemisphere. We're in the north. So problem number one. 
Problem number two, we had limitations with the telescope itself. So the telescope can only go down to 16 degrees before you have to bounce back up, before you destroy it. And if you destroy it, well, that's $100,000 that it's going to come out of my pocket. I'm a poor college student. So uh, that's not something we want to do. Um, number of visible targets, obviously we're in the southern hemisphere, so it's harder to see these things. Then we have equipment malfunctions where the dome and the telescope were synced up. So uh, the dome turns this way and the telescope keeps, keeps pointing, you can't take images. The CCD camera was on the fritz at times. Weather conditions, the weather was horrible, target identification was, was a problem, and observation timing, we had, uh, we had to speed it up because it was the end of the bold season. Now, to uh, give you a demonstration of weather, since I'm not going to show you clouds, uh, I have a volunteer in the audience that's going to come up, and I'm going to quickly demonstrate what it's like to take images uh, when you're trying to dodge weather. And he's going to try to take 10 good photos of the screen, and I'm going to be the weather. <laughs> get it? Get the photo! Oh, got it? Got it? Yeah, it was one more, right? So, Yeah, it's a little, it's a little difficult, uh, if you can imagine, to take pictures of the night sky with clouds. Uh, it's really obnoxious. Uh, and this does not make us very happy. In fact, it's more accurate to say that it kind of makes us angry. You know, I was kind of pissed when it would happen. Um, research impediments. So, the telescope, we took an image of the dome one night. We were like, oh yeah, everything looks straight. Oh wait, <laughs> that's the inside of our telescope dome. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, one night, the roof caved in. Um, and uh, one of us almost fell through. Uh, about two feet down through the tiles. Uh, so that's funny. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I almost fell through. That's my mentor, Joe's legs, uh, that he almost fell through. Uh, I thought it was funny. Maybe you guys don't. But uh, <laughs> target identification. So these are what the fields look like. Um, and I'll give you $20 if you can find the target just eyeballing it. Um, and just to avoid losing, I'll tell you that the targets, uh, deal's over, you guys are going to tell you. Uh, targets are about here and in the dead center of that one. But it wasn't always dead center, as you can see. So how did I have to find it? Well, target identification method. Well, that's a fancy way of saying I found some target stars, drew circles, and, and then drew some lines to them. Uh, so, and really what I was doing was I was narrowing down the position that this star could be in. And I swear, I, I stared at this for probably two weeks, just eyeballing it, and then realized, wait, what am I doing? Just, just get a reference image from, from a sky map and map it. And I found it within an hour. So uh, that was a good two week of, uh, wasted two weeks of my time. Um, so what you're probably saying is, wait a second, this is not what the title should have been. Your title should have been detecting things we can't see with equipment that doesn't work and weather that is out to get us. <laughs> and by the way, these are very dim events, so we really can't see them either. So that's uh, kind of an unusual thing. You're observing these you can't really see. Um, but we did see something. We had four good event detections that, that I identified in images. And so those were the four things we looked at. Now, of course, we had some criterion that we implemented so that we could properly see these things. Um, so whether or not they were bright enough for us to detect and how long they were active. So really, we only had two good, uh, two good events we could look at. One was Ogle 963, which is an abstract name I'm I understand. Uh, that's just how they name it. Um, so Ogle 963, you have this nice magnification of it. And you, the blue is, is uh, the professional team. On this, on this axis, you have star magnitude. You can think of that sort of as brightness. Um, and then you have the date here. So you see over time, you get this nice magnification of this, of this star. And our orange is our data. And that's a linear fit. It's not perfect. We're going to recalibrate it. But that's what it kind of looks like. Um, and then, so that's, that's shown again here in the graph with error bars. Um, you know, I'm glad no one's asking me how do you explain your error because I really wouldn't enjoy answering your question. But um, no one does. Uh, so you have this nice black peak up here that uh, is, is your main event. And then this is a reference star here with a little bit of uh, perturbation, a little difference in the brightness. But that's because this was a lower magnification event. But the cool one was this one. So you can see the middle star here is actually getting lens. It's raised by almost two magnitudes. It's getting incredibly bright. So I mean, just look at that. That's cool. Ooh, ah. That's what I'm doing. Come on, guys. Jeez. Wow. So again, you can see that kind of is the first one. This is August and this is October. 
very bright. So here is the curve, orange and blue again, very high mag event for us anyways. And then of course, this one as well, you can see this nice peak going up, and, and this one is, there's differences here, but it's not as apparent. So what you're probably saying is, Ryan, all it really is is you sort of kind of detected things that we can't see, but with that doesn't work, and with weather, that never happens. And I agree, I absolutely agree, which is why I generalized what you just said, and I said detecting microlensing events when all goes according to plan, which of course, is a number. <laughs> So, what does this imply? Well, I have no life when I'm single. But, uh, but science-wise, uh, well, it's a conducive environment for these observations, and we can obtain data that is good, and it's just as good as professional teams. So that makes us capable of being a follow-up location. And if we started at the beginning of the bowl season in May, we probably would have gotten much more data, and much uh, better data. And so looking ahead, we're gonna recalibrate our data, we're gonna continue observations in May, and we're going to start a student observatory network, in which case we're going to indoctrinate other SFN students into our field. <laughs> and so thank you to the Oscar program for the grant. Uh, thank you to those people who got data and helped me along the way. My, my uh, mentor, Goddard, my, my mentor, Joe Brown, here, uh, my references. And thank you all for listening so much. I'm out of time. <laughs>